been addressed by Dr. Rakesh Singh, Chairman ISCM on Philosophy of Demand Planning and Forecasting. Good morning, everybody. And I, as a Chairman of Institute of Supply Chain Management, once again welcome all of you to our Demand Planning and Forecasting Forum, which is running into the sixth edition. Uh, to kick start, start this particular forum, uh, in fact, it was very confusing as to where to start from. One of the fundamental beliefs that we all have had in terms of forecasting has been undergoing transformation. I think uh, this transformation in terms of planning and the role of forecasting itself is a journey. And this journey has, is being shaped by uh, multiple events, multiple developments, and multiple uh, you know uh, factors that define the context of business today. We were thinking it was technology that was driving the change pre-COVID. Everybody called technology as disruption. I think people have forgotten technology as a disruption. It is the best friend that we have today. Everywhere you go, you say, is the technology that's going to define the new philosophy of forecasting and demand planning. There's a lot of questions that we hear about forecasting itself. I remember in our planning synods that we started instead of the DPFL, there has been so much of talk about debt of forecasting. Right, Dr. Sina? <laughs> and Dr. Sina, who uh, was with Godre's Consumer Product Limited, was one of the proponents of not data forecasting. I must have read it long that time. It was more of bringing agility into planning, which really defines the way we can move ahead. And I think that whole debate of forecasting debt and uh, the concept of uh, DDMRP, theory of constraints, all of them have seen a kind of, uh, you know, success in terms of defining this new framework, philosophy, paradigm and philosophy. The very fundamental question that goes is that, is forecasting required? I will not say that because it is a copyright of our business review. Anyone can say HBR.org and look at debt of supply chain and says that anything which is connected does not need anybody in the world to do forecasting. As your forecasting and demand planning are going to be the most automatic way of doing planning. We have a panel on bionic supply chains later in the evening and I think we would have some interesting thought on that. How does one really look at this whole philosophy of demand forecasting? Do we forecast? Or we just look at real time visibility? Or we leave it to the algorithms, which are with sound chaos theory foundation. I am just using one theoretical framework that actually defines everything which is complex, structure, unstructure, and everything. And I thought has this simple framework, simple philosophy, simple paradigm of forecasting totally transformed, changed, and irrelevant? And I thought I'll first let the, let, I used to call it as four pillars of forecasting before the COVID. I thought I'll just put them into it and say that, and look at each one of them quickly and see what has happened. Over a period of time, and I'm just talking about, because we do awards, we do get some insight from what companies are doing, and we do get uh, some consulting and training. We also get more insight into what companies are doing. And I'm seeing one fundamental change that is in successful companies. I would say successful companies. In fact, I was surprised. We are currently running a certification course in demand planning and forecasting. And 
90% of the companies, some of the good names, uh, are dominated by Excel based planner. Meaning that all the talk about change that we are saying is still housed in older technologies where people are comfortable with. And hence, what I think is that when you talk about forecasting, there is a need to really look at the role of forecasting, not just the assumption behind forecasting. Assumptions have changed. Today, assumptions are different than what were in 2019. And tomorrow, assumptions are being dictated by the kind of global trends that are emerging. But even the understanding of forecasting, what it can do, is slightly you know, messed up with the need for businesses to run their businesses, to align their demand and supplies, which is a fundamental challenge. How do you move ahead with forecasting now? And people who measure forecast accuracy, I see, I, I got a query sometimes back from a consulting firm that how do I really increase the forecast accuracy? This was a researcher dilemma. The purpose was not how to improve the demand planning. The purpose was to use a method which gives you the best accuracy. And this is where a lot of skills resides in organization with a huge amount of statistical understanding and no operational efficacies. Is it important to use forecast accuracy as a uh, measure for accuracy of your plans or of a demand planning? And I would say that there is a need to move away from forecast accuracy as a baseline as a very essential element of this component of planning. Add demand planning variables into it. We may call it anything as I may also go ahead and talk about them. Look at demand variability or variability of the demand plans over actuals and see whether your plan is better or not. Why are we so worried about forecast accuracy? There's a fundamental challenge that we need to move away from this forecast accuracy because it provides the essential critical input of what is certain in the organization and allows us to understand the current and some future in a way that we can understand it, sense it, predict it, and prescribe certain strategies for it. Now that's the missing element. And finally, all of us know, despite whatever we do, forecast management remains to be a very, or demand plan management remains to be a very critical challenge. I think I'm happy because over the five, six years that few companies have applied for our awards, there is a tremendous movement towards cross-functionality in a large number of successful organizations within India which have shown some amount of framework of building the processes, building the structures and marrying with the strategic planning in order to make demand planning a more fruitful engine for planning itself and strategic planning itself. This, according to me, and this year also we have got nominations, successful companies do this, unsuccessful companies don't do this. They don't understand this basic transition. Whatever, however sophisticated you are in your technical analysis, however sophisticated your visualization is, the gap is here. You are building this gap and that's it. Fundamental challenge for organization is this. I'll tell you, I, I was doing a lecture in 2004 in Singapore for Procter & Gamble for the demand planning team. One fundamental question that came up in a big way is that that's the time when SNOP, IPP became a little fashionable. The starting. And they build up an amazing SNOP process. But one of their senior managers says that we have a robust, ever the line planning and ununderstood below the line planning, meaning we never define how do you manage, sense, forecast, 
uh, you know, align our inventory and orders. Sometimes, uh, and I, in fact, some sense of that still exists today. Because one of the companies last year with applied had a very interesting SNOP. And what was that SNOP? It says, I have a SNOP process. And because to keep with time, we have a dynamic SNOP. You have a SNOP process which should be dynamic, then why do you have a dynamic SNOP process? You know what the dynamics was? Any demand from anywhere in the market has to be has to be serviced. So you created fire fighting as dynamic. Part of your some SNOP, which you call it as a dynamic. I think managing the forecast. Defining the demand plan over and ever the forecasting plan, measuring the accuracy of the demand plan is the new paradigm and the transformation that I was talking about. Is forecasting still relevant? Let's look at it. And when I really look at forecasting as relevant, what I've seen is that just look at the red one. It's you know, at, Professor, when he does this, it puts everything there, what he knows, right? Uh, to <laughs> get back to it in trouble. So, if I say, I'm just taking a little different approach to forecasting. I say Salesforce comported as grassroots forecasting. Everyone knows that this is one of the most widely used mental model in the world. Market research, expert forecast estimation. Time series forecast, causal demand forecast, I don't know how many of us do it, but yes, it is it. What do we do, we do with this forecast? Look at this. What I found was that story remains this. Once we do this forecasting and we quote aggregate forecast errors, if you see the aggregate forecast made, it is 11.2% for the first category in this particular case. And if you really look at some of the elements, have 86, 1573 percent, 52, 51, there is no relationship. The aggregate, when this aggregated, becomes very, very difficult to manage. I know there are a lot of thought about why volume forecast is important. Nobody denies that. Why can't volume force part be granular here? And that's the big challenge that one really needs to ask. Why should there be a forecast which should be volume based and disaggregated? Most SNOP still run on that basis. And I think uh, I've seen this happening across the companies that we have been engaged with. Meaning, we want to be very different. We don't want to forecast at all. Whether it's a kind of firewalls or PVB, this is a Harvard Business case study. I have only, sometimes none of you would like to share data with us. So the only source is Harvard Business Review. Everybody wants to share data with Harvard Business School because you get a kudos, right? Please share it with us. I think it will help all of us to understand this in a much better way. And what happens? This is another Harvard Business School case. I think nobody replaces this case today. You know, one of my colleagues said, don't use the old PPTs. I said, no, you can always use the old PPT in a new way, right? And this says, when a standard deviation is 300, uh, 227, mean is 300, calculate all your inventory planning. Most of you must have done an MBA. It's 1100 unit. What does it mean? Your average demand is just 300. You are producing 1100 over the 52 weeks. You are creating your own variability. Why blame the forecast? Why blame the forecast? And hence, forecasting remains very relevant because we need to identify this. And if you can identify this, then we can solve the dilemma of forecasting, demand planning, and demand management. And hence, this is something that the world is changing. It's changing in a big way. A friend of mine and a thought leader on uh, uh, forecasting, uh, Stephen Dickock, 
I have just borrowed it for him because it's much easier for us to talk about it. Globalization, Amazon effect, and market volatility. Now, what does globalization do? It essentially splits the volume over more nodes in the network. For a global company, it creates challenges in terms of more networks, more volume dispersed. Your implied uncertainty is high, your standard deviation is high, and there's a challenge for you to focus and understand and plan. If you look at Amazon effect and look at what is happening, you'll find that Amazon has allowed companies to ag just aggregate and aggregate and aggregate, creating proliferation of the offering that is there. But that's not limited to just Amazon. What has happened exactly is that proliferation and there are so many FMCC's companies sitting here. I can easily say that it's not because of you're just adding SKUs. What are you doing? You are forced to create those SKUs to create customer experience. Whatever word you may use, either on the customer and rest is your choice. Right? You need this proliferation of uh, SKUs. And as you do this, there's another impact. You never realize that e-commerce is going to be creating a great impact on your overall planning. What has uh, e-commerce done? It has opened up another channel which is growing at the fastest speed, adding a lot of intermittency and a lot of long tail. As proliferation increases, lumpy demands goes up and I think some of you told me while discussing is that this is an amazing period because of supplies are less, maybe through the lumpy latent demand. Maybe, just think about it. And if it is lumpy latent demand, the long tail is a reality. And in this long tail, how do you forecast? When there is huge product proliferation, there is more frequent replenishment with many more periods of zero demands, many more periods of demands which are much lower. Don't apply the traditional ABC, you would be out of place and out of job. The ABC analysis does not work here. All those who rationalize, uh, you know, uh, SKUs may find it difficult to survive. You look at spare parts, I think Anirudh is not here. If you see spare parts listing in the last seven, eight months, I have some access to those data. This is so true, zero demand, lumpy demand, intermittent demand for some product with much lower this thing. And we don't know, what do we do? We use the old historical data as some market research, which does not give you any kind of insight into the data. And hence, whatever you say, this is the reality for forecasting. You know, Keynes once said, you have to be, you have to be, you don't have to be precisely right. You have to be roughly wrong. That's forecasting. The principle philosophy remains also true. And this is where I picked up from uh, Stephen's paper. If you have ever heard expression like forecast is always wrong, or plans are useless by the time they are published because things have changed, it is because forecasts and plans traditionally approximate uncertain values with exact numbers. Find out the ifs and what if sensitivity and scenarios within your data, even in the short run. And how do you do that? In old ways, you had month, item, country, you fit a curve. When you fit a curve, it was something like you have a single number mean. Everything, what method you use is mean, nothing else. You find the average and you plan on the average, not knowing the negative biases or positive biases which you create because of that bullwhip. How are you going to be right with your forecasting when, when this happens? And this is where I think there is a change in a new way where you fit distributions. And what do you do? Forecast the best streams on the right side rather than have a single number based on everything is a normal distribution. 
why should everything be normal distribution? Assuming that everything is a normal distribution, you are really creating a, uh, you know, a, a kind of forecasting technology methods which is predetermined and which is normal and linear. Where is non-linearity, volatility and other things in your demand focus? The fundamental question is that how, why do you plan for one number? Do you deal with one number? There is no same as single plan. Single plan can be with multiple numbers. Why do you deal with one number? Why do you focus with one number? And I think this is where focusing has been demeaned. Organizations have, what is the best known, we did a survey last year, I think of around 200 demand planners and I think one of the most widely used method is demand for, uh, is time series and self force composite can equal, I think they use both. This is something that needs to be looked at it. The long tail captures all the resilience that you need in your organization. You say forecast cannot be resilient. It can be. You are not looking at resilient. You are making everything linear, predicting the most predictable one and wanting the market to behave like a normal distribution curve and now market should converge to your forecast. Does it happen that way? And that's the basic difference. And that's where the approaches needs to change. And hence, I would say that move into, move into Averages are bad, distributions are good. Distribution must not be normal. Accurate case of distribution brings resilience. It is impossible to be resilient against everything. This also has limitations. But some of you understand statistics at 99.7 confidence level, it still can show you resilience. Beyond that, it cannot because that cannot be captured. And if that cannot be captured, then you need to move here. And this is where I got educated by someone sitting in the audience. I won't name it. It's very important for us to build for this distribution to be captured. I would say what technology, I don't know. I've seen people talking about so many technologies and you know, talking uh, so proficiently about technology that the purpose is lost. It's simple. Sensor everywhere, networks everywhere, automate everything, analyze everything with data. That's what technology can do. Fit the best technology there. There are so many CPOs, CIOs and companies that can give you connected planning frameworks. And I think autonomous planning makes a lot of sense in this sense. And autonomous planning brings every notes and look into this thing and it can help you do something very interesting. Analytics. Big data analytics is different than the statistics that we use. Why? Because it can capture the chaos in your data and give you some structure to work on it. And if you understand the analytics and evolution of analytics and, uh, you know, uh, uh, the components of analytics, it can give you a more, more important thing. Making everything connected in a way that you see it in this, this particular example from the McKinsey, it's called supply, that's the article's name from there. And it says everything is connected. You can actually have full data transparency. What lies where in the more, this is what supply chain is, death of supply chain. The article that in Harvard Business Week talked about essentially says that everything can be seen. If you have enough data, you can do predictive shipping. Your truck can be filled much before the demand comes. And as it goes in, the customer can uh, re reroute shipment via mobile phones because the demand uh, comes a little where and you save a lot of time. There's an automatic routing that happens and you save your uh, you know network costs, your cost to serve, and everything becomes so rationalized. But as this looks so great, there are a lot of constraints that happen because what happens is that we do not understand the role of analytics. Now look at this. I have just taken few elements as an influence and factor in demand planning and how one can treat them as advertisements and marketing advertisements and local competition, 
shop attractiveness, shop assortment and layout, available products at point of sale and expiring products, supply factor, retail factor, marketing factor. Let me just look at the promotion factor, which essentially creates large amount of bullwhip. Simple. When you use descriptive analytics, it can help you to give you all the categories. When you use predictive, it gives you the elasticity of you know, demand due to promotions and changes granular level and that's what is it and then you optimize the timing of promotion prescribe the amount of additional products needed use them in your planning i think this is what is the simple role of uh, analytics that is there in the organization and every factors when you understand the role of descriptive predict uh, predictive and prescriptive analytics you can plan this better what it essentially means is this when you plan that better, before going to what it means, numeric and graphical digital demand data dashboards are including digital twins and everything talks about is important. There is a need for us to understand where does data lies, what are alternatives to this demand data and demand, how do you serve customer through alternative and you need uh, geographical mapping. You know from where we can route it. Your control tasks are essentially successful when you move beyond your prescriptive, uh, descriptive, predictive, prescriptive to even mapping each and every geographies of your, your locations. In fact, demands are becoming so location specific. If you remember, and this company, again, I'm bringing the old slides here because this is evolution that I think is important to be understood. This is as of 6.30 in the morning. These data are available. I just picked up COVID again. And it just tells us where the COVID cases are. It's a real-time data which helps you to understand the geography. You know where the... Uh, and if it is, it gets more intense like the COVID period one, period two, and the lengthier period of period one and shorter period of period two, you understand which geographies are affected, which are high demand areas, which are low demand areas. You can restructure all your, uh, you know, uh, uh, supply factors into uh, and focus your uh, logistics, transportation, people, everything into that because these are all in shortages. Use geography as a great tool of planning. And if you don't use geography, then it's done. So data is only not about what you have from your notes because your notes cannot capture these changes. And there are enough data that is available here. Google Mobility, we saw some of you clearly using Google Mobility in your what's uh, this thing. And I think it was interesting to see one company, uh, we can't name the company, so even if they're done well, that they use Google Mobility during the period in such a way that they, they could predict the kind of geographies where high demand would be there. There are so much that can be done. You can predict events around that. You can, in fact, I've been seeing suppliers moving and predicting who are their suppliers, who are their alternate suppliers, who can be affected in terms of when they're affected, who can be approached. It gives you an amazing procurement and distribution planning framework. And I think this is where you need to move into it. And for all this, read this recent uh, Harvard Business School article. Better way to put your data to work. It says simple. Is your data a product? Is your data solving your problem? All your customers within your supply chain get the right data analytics and visualization. And if you can use all these mechanisms to build that data, the supply chain is live, not dead. And it moves in a direction which helps you to plan better and do much better. You would be better off without, uh, with this rather than without this. And hence, to me, the philosophy of forecasting is that forecasting is changing its tentacles with technology and no forecast can be true without the organization is supported by the top man and is supported by a process. In fact, what we saw was that in 2015, when we started, and I'll name this company, HUL had applied for the award. One of the most beautiful things that really came out at that point of time was that governance. 
governance of your demand planning and SNOP. Right, Girish? We were amazed when someone presented Asis, presented it, Asis Gujarati, and I think the way it was presented, it was a very simple framework. The jury had two opinions. There is no analytics, there is no statistics, there is nothing. Why should we vote for this company? Nobody understood what they, they were talking about because they are so obsessed. If you go to a business school, a supply chain professor is only with numbers. And what does he do? He uses the whole theories of optimization and keep pushing through. Need to move with the direction of the change, transformation. And I think demand planning in India is moving, but there are not many companies which exist to be. We have got back to firefighting again. Your R M R P lead times are very high. Your customer tolerance time is lesser than your uh, lead time, both manufacturing and distribution. And they are struggling with changes. Please change your M R P. Come back to a situation where your MRP gives you a situation where your lead times can be changed. Take Dr. Sina's help to build the lower lead times, right sir? You need agility into the system. What are you doing? You are building a huge, huge lead time. So what happens? Everybody says my last bucket, whatever is the planning horizon is very heavy. Market changes, but the buckets remain the same, and I think that's where we need to change. Thank you very much.